Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing very well today, Tim. Really couldn't ask to be doing any better. Hope all the listeners are doing fantastic. Um, but I have a feeling that some of the listeners are not doing fantastic because they are unsure of how you are doing. So why don't you appease them, make them feel a little better? How are you? <laughs> Thank you, Lance, for asking. I'm doing great. I'm excited to bring this episode to our fine audience. We spoke with our researchers from Private Investigations for the Missing. And Private Investigations for the Missing is the nonprofit that Lance and I are on the board of. You can find out more about what they do at investigationsforthemissing.org, and you can follow their social pages as well. This episode features three researchers who volunteer their valuable time to PIs for the Missing to research these missing persons cases. And so in this episode, we're joined by Kathleen Studer, Erica Zapita, and Amy Weckel, as well as Crawlspace Media's Jennifer Amell to discuss some cases. And we want to keep this going. We want to have this be like a once a month type thing because after we did the first researcher roundtable, we put a call out for other researchers to volunteer their time as well because as everybody knows, there is not a shortage of missing person cases out there. And we do receive dozens of requests from family members to look into their missing loved one. So we want to keep doing these so people can identify with the individuals who are volunteering their time relate to them and hear how their process works. Because if you're on the fence about volunteering, not only for private investigations for the missing, but for any organization that is trying to do some good and help families out, this might be the catalyst that puts you over. Hearing them talk about their process and hearing them talk about the range of emotions that they go through when they're looking into these missing persons, again, it normalizes it, it makes it a little less business-like, and it makes it, I think, a little easier if you're about to make that decision to volunteer. And in this episode, we speak about several cases, and the first one is about the disappearance of Jessica Nicole Stacks from New Albany, Mississippi on New Year's Day 2021. And we produced an episode about Jessica Stacks' disappearance, and it was released on April 14th, 2022. And Jessica is missing from Little Tallahatchie River, New Albany, Mississippi, 28 years old at the time of her disappearance. Caucasian female, 5 foot 5 inches, date of birth June 11th, 1992, about 110 to 115 pounds, blonde slash strawberry hair, green eyes, not sure what clothing she was wearing at the time of her disappearance. And recently we spoke with Jessica's mother and recorded that interview and it was one of the more emotional ones that we've ever experienced so stay tuned for that in the near future and the second case we discuss in the researcher roundtable is the disappearance of terry's price from the platte river in nebraska and this is a really tragic case she is uh suspected to have been swept away essentially by the river and um boy this one's this one's really sad and while this isn't necessarily considered a crime, an abduction or anything of that nature, it does look like the Platte River swept Terry's away. It's so tragic because this is a little girl. She was eight years old and playing with others. And then the next moment she's gone and they haven't been able to recover the body. So this is a situation where the researcher will look into this disappearance, not to find out exactly who's involved and what happened and all the possibilities that could come of that, but perhaps an attempt to raise the awareness so that more in-depth searches can be conducted. And the third case we speak about is the disappearance of John Frank Carlisle from Sewanee County, Florida, and he's been missing since April 24th, 2018. He's classified as an endangered white male, date of birth, October 14th, 1977. He was 40 years old at the time of his disappearance. He would be 44 years old today, 5 foot 5 inches, about 180 to 200 pounds. And it should be taken into consideration that Carlisle may do harm to himself because he has a history of violent behavior and caution is advised if you see him when approaching him. This information is coming from the charlieproject.org. And then finally, Lance, we speak about the murder of 17-year-old Blake Chappelle. And Blake went missing on October 16th, 2011, 
and then was found about two months later deceased in a creek in East Noonan, Georgia. And this one is a little bit different because the researcher is looking at the details of Blake's disappearance as well as the details of his body being found on December 19th, like you said, about two months later. So the circumstances there obviously are very suspect. This one made me realize how much of an emotional toll researching these cases might take and also just talking about it during these roundtables, how that is kind of a therapeutic thing to do. Because as the researcher Kathleen was looking into it, she was describing 17-year-old Blake and how he was a fun kid, how there was one incident where he was caught in the bedroom of his girlfriend by the girlfriend's parents, and he fled out the window, and then he was texting them, making sure that everything was all good, and they weren't doing anything in the bedroom, but he, he got into a little bit of trouble, but he was such a good kid that he ended up talking to the mom and making sure that everything was still all good, so... I don't know if there's something there relatable with Kathleen, but you could tell that she identified with uh, a 17-year-old adolescent. And it's just tragic that this kid who's seemed like a really good kid from from all the all the research and all indications, and then this tragedy happens to him. Okay, everybody. So I hope you enjoy this episode. Please check out the links in the show notes. And before we play the conversation with our wonderful researchers, just want to let our audience know about Missing Premium. It is where you can get every single episode of Missing ad-free, as well as a weekly bonus show called Hidden Opinions that we do. And you can check this out at missing.supportingcast.fm. And Hidden Opinions, if you're listening to the public feed, you'll know that we try to stick as close to all of the details and the facts of someone's disappearance without getting too much into our own personal theories. We, we might go a little bit there, but on the Hidden Opinions, that's where we push the throttle a little further. We get a little more animated. We talk a little bit more about our theories and how they might make sense, how they might not make sense. And then... If there's a very strong person of interest, we will probably have a very strong opinion about this person, a very strong revealed opinion about this person. Okay, everybody, thanks a lot for listening. Follow us on social media at Missing CSM. And before we get to this episode, we're going to break real quick with a word from our sponsors. Welcome back to the Researcher Roundtable. I am Tim here today with Lance and Jen and some researchers from Private Investigations for the Missing. We're joined by Amy, Erica, and Kathleen. How's it going, everybody? Doing really well. Very well. Wow, yes. It's great to have everybody back in the saddle again for another one of these roundtable discussions. Uh, the last one that we did, we thought went really well. We thought it went over really well with the audience, and there's no reason why we can't continue these at least once every few weeks, bring everybody um, current with what's going on behind the scenes, maybe a little uh, indication of what's been going on since certain episodes have aired, and all the hard work that you, uh, you ladies are doing. It's fantastic. Awesome. Thanks for uh, joining us again. Um, I want to share a little anecdote. Since we aired our first researcher roundtable, we put the call out to the community. Like if you have research skills, if you have computer skills to write to us um, because we desperately need research volunteers. And we actually got a fantastic new researcher. Her name is Emma. So thank you, Emma. Hopefully she's listening. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you, Emma. Hopefully uh, she'll join us on one of these at some point soon. So this is a general question to anybody who looked at Emma's application. What was it about her that made her stand out and, and have you decide that this was the right person to move forward with? So she actually shared um, in our, our Slack message, our researcher folder, um, she shared a document of her like information that she's gathered, research resources. And I haven't gotten to take like a really in-depth look at it, at it yet, but it looks fantastic. Um, it looks like she's put in a lot of work into that. The resources look great. And I think it's going to be something that we can all use on the research um, team. And so she's already contributing. I mean, that was the first thing she said, hi, she introduced herself. And then she was like, let me share what I have gathered with all of you guys. So that's fan. I mean, I was super excited by that. Absolutely. She jumped right in as soon as she was onboarded. Um, And she has a pretty interesting background, too. She's a graduate student currently, and she's studying uh, computer forensics. So a well-resourced individual. 
Happy to have her. And a lot of these cases come in through private investigations for the missing, which you can learn more about at investigationsforthemissing.org. And please follow their social pages. There are links in the show notes. A little while ago, we released an episode about the disappearance of Jessica Stacks from New Albany, Mississippi on New Year's Day in 2021. That episode was released April 14th, 2022. And we just wanted to talk about the case a little bit and highlight it and uh, discuss what's going on with it. Yeah, um, that's a case that I did. I wanted to sort of keep it in the public eye. I, as a researcher, sign up for a lot of the Facebook pages or you know social media pages for the missing people. This is one of the most active groups in trying to figure out what happened to Jessica. So I've been watching them and they've been doing a lot of great work. And I thought it was a great time to bring her back into the minds of everybody. Uh, And I'm hoping I hear that uh, Jennifer is finally going to have a a conversation with her mom, which we were missing in that episode. uh, And I was really interested in hearing what her mom had to say. Yeah, we are having Kathy on. That episode will be released in August. So I don't know if everybody remembers this case, but this is where a gal and her boyfriend, Jessica and her boyfriend, went missing on New Year's Day. They had launched a boat early, early that morning into the Tallahatchie River to go hunting. And per her boyfriend, Jerry, She had gotten out uh, maybe about two miles downstream and walked off and never to be heard from again. Uh, The the investigators went right away when he reported it missing. Well, he didn't report it missing right away, but um, at night when he finally reported her missing, they had started the investigation and eventually found some clothing that may have been hers and some Prince walking out towards a field and pretty much nothing of her since. And this is a case that's really bothered me because where did Jessica go? The problem with where the footstep footprints stopped was that there was water in the field. So they couldn't trace them anymore. And the, the boyfriend has just not been helpful, nor has anybody else. But I think this is a case where there's more than one person that knows what happened. So the possibility of somebody slipping up or finally deciding to tell the whole story is really high. And so I want to keep talking about it because somebody, again, not to be cliche, but somebody knows something and somebody's going to talk sometime. And the more pressure that we can keep on this case, Potentially, it has the likelihood that someone's going to realize that we're all talking about it. It's going out nationally and internationally, and they're going to finally cave and talk to the investigator. His name is um, Jimmy Edwards. They have been doing some searches for her afterwards, but they're just coming up empty handed. Um, And the, the people who are doing the research on social media, I think, have a lot of information. But the other problem with this case is that Uh, There has been a lot of gossip back and forth, which has muddied the water for the investigator, which has caused problems with him trying to work on the investigation. I can understand that it takes more time, but I think that in information that comes out, there's always going to be a little truth in it. And if they could take the time to track that down, there's a potential that they could figure out what happened to Jessica. Interesting stuff there. You said that it's um, more than one person that is likely responsible for this. Do you think that the social media attention and the social media posts are getting to the eyes of one or more of these people? I don't think that more than one person is responsible. I think that more than one person knows what happened, whether they witnessed it or or they were told it and it's accurate what they were told. But I think it seems to be from what everybody's talking about, there is a group of people that may be involved in a cover up of something that happened to her. 
uh, and, and, and I've sort of filtered through a lot of the gossip and that it seems to keep coming around to that. And I think that those people are aware that they're being watched. Um, I mean, obviously one of them is her boyfriend, Jerry and his friends. One of the, the main people that we talked about, Willie, who went with them um, to drop the boat and then went back and was supposed to pick them up later. He had Jessica's phone and they were gonna call him to come, to come get them. Uh, he keeps, one of the things that keeps happening is that he keeps cycling through jail. Um, and every time he's in jail, they're posting this and showing this. And I've seen that before, um, not that that implies any guilt on him whatsoever, but I've seen that before where somebody who knows something really terrible, they start to drink more, do drugs more, do more bad things as a way to try to numb what it is that they know. And it seems like, I don't know if he was in this cycle before, but he's definitely seems to be in that cycle now. And I think that he may be one of the weakest links. That's a, yeah, that's a really interesting point that you make, Kathleen. I think it additionally um, presents an opportunity to the prosecutor's office and the DA to maybe use leverage if he is in for like a misdemeanor or, you know, something small that if he does have information, they could maybe strike a deal with him um, to get information on what happened to Jessica. Yeah, I agree. I mean, obviously I work in a prosecutor's office. So I know how those things work and that could totally work if investigators are motivated um, and looking in that direction. Unfortunately, I think that some of the back and forth that's happening, they're, they're not, I, I don't know where their motivation lies in, in solving this. And, and that's the question that I would have to it. I, I know that um, one of our private investigators has reached out to the sheriff. Uh, and I know that we're, we're at the moment not, uh, not going that route in this case because it's still so active. It only happened in, in 2021 on January 1st. So it's a year and a half old. And they may not have, have fully let the, the sheriff's department um, do what they need to do before a private investigator really needs to get into the middle of it. I don't know. Wow. And um, so where does this play out online? Just uh, out of curiosity. It is a private uh, group regarding Jessica and the people looking into her case. It's not her family. Like many of the case, many of the, the social media pages are run by a family member and it's just one person. This is by a group of people. You have to answer questions to be able to, you know, get on before they let you on their page because they're trying to keep people they don't want on there out. And luckily enough, they, they let me in. So I'm seeing all the different things that they're doing as far as research. Some of them are a little on the, on the woo side, but it's actually kind of interesting but I get to watch all of it play out. And I think the, the woman that runs it seems to have a pretty level head on her shoulders and is doing a really good job at sussing a lot of the information out. And what do you um, look for? Are, is there any flags that come up where when you're going through the, uh, the, the information online? Any keywords? Not specifically. I just watch everything and then balance it with what I know. So that mm. it's, you know, I mean, obviously, if you're he hearing someone say, hey, I heard someone say that someone said, I I I'm not going to pay much attention to it. I'm going to look for when a bunch of different people are saying the same thing over and over again. And, uh, you know, and when they can bring things up, like the, the page that shows that Willie's in custody with his booking photo, you know, I mean, obviously... I, I know that that's, that's real. And so, you know, I watched that. I watched them. One of the other things they're really stuck on is that video of them at the one stop where you just see if I, I think I, I just gave you guys photos, but we have the whole video and I've watched it and I gave you a still shot where there's someone in the truck that opens the door just a little tiny bit and says something out to, to Jerry. And the, they're not convinced that that was Jessica at the time. There is thought that she went missing a day or two previously. And this is just 
something to make it look like this is where Jessica went. You know, that's always a possibility that that's gossip, but it's not necessarily out of the realm of possibility. Nobody that we know of saw her in the, in the, that it's from her family or a friend group that saw her in the, like, I think two days prior to when she went missing. So we don't, we don't know for sure. And so they have an idea of who the person in the truck might've been. I don't know if that's actual or not. There's no way to really tell, but there's a bunch of information kind of out there that, that may or may not prove anything. There's another woman apparently that they run with that looks kind of like the person in this picture. Anyway, I just, I watch all of the pages uh, for, for everybody that I've worked on for updates. Cause obviously if there's updates, I want to update you guys. And this is just one of those that there's just, they, they are just continually pounding the pavement on it. Interesting. Well, yeah, that's good to hear. Great. Thank you for the updates. I think it's great that they are monitoring who's coming into that Facebook group because it really lets them put like control on and, and kind of filter who is looking at that missing persons and who's like, if anybody's monitoring that page, I just thought that just gave me an idea that like, I know, I know a lot of Facebook groups are open um, because the family wants to get as much information out as possible, but another avenue is to keep that Facebook group closed or to have like, you know, both have both going and have the family kind of monitor or somebody monitor who is watching, who, who's trying to watch those Facebook pages. I just thought that was a really good kind of a resource maybe for missing persons for family members and things like that. I have not thought about that in the past. Yeah. That's, what's kind of cool about this page. Um, and uh, there's a, there's a couple of others too, but it's, it's a lot of the conversation is not family. And it's, you know, people who are invested in this, even if they don't even know Jessica, if they, they just get in and want to get roll up their sleeves and, and try to get something done like, like we do here, but in, you know, a less formal way. Um, the other thing I did after this, actually in another group, private group that I just joined for the case I'm, I'm working on next, I actually now just put on my about uh, that this is something I'm doing that I'm a fallen that I research for private investigation for the missing so that they can see that so that they'll hopefully let me in. So you're putting the credential of working with uh, private investigations for the missing as something that will motivate them or have you stand out to motivate them to allow you in. Yeah, I didn't. That's do cool. That. I didn't do that at first only because I was trying to be sort of the behind the scenes silent um, you know, since I'm not supposed to contact anybody, but I did that recently just because I ran into a couple of them where they were private groups and I wanted to make sure that I got in. That's a great idea. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. And Amy, you wanted to discuss the very tragic disappearance of Terry Price from Gretna, Nebraska, June 11th, 2020. Tell us a little bit about this case. Yeah, you're right. It is tragic. She was eight years old, and this was still around the summer of uh, COVID. So a lot of public pools and things like that were closed. And so people, more and more people were taking their kids to the lake to cool down the lakes or rivers around the area. So Thierry's was eight years old. At the time she went missing, um, her nickname and all of her family call her Juicy. So that's cute. She would now be 10 years old. Her mom took her and her siblings down to the Platte River um, on that June 11th. And around three o'clock in the afternoon, she was um, separated briefly from her mom and went with her aunt and a couple of her cousins um, down to get a picture. Um, so they were separated a little bit. But mom still kind of had eyes on her. Um, I'm not too clear on that part of it. But basically, they weren't supposed to be in the water. They didn't have life jackets on. And uh, her aunt turned around um, maybe to go back and talk to Thierry's mom um, and maybe bring the other kids down to meet them on the sandbar that they were playing on. I'm not certain. But 
the next thing you know, all three girls, so it's Terry's and two of her cousins are in the water and they're drowning. Um, there's some story that the sandbar kind of went out from under their feet. They're not really sure. Thierry's was in the middle of the two, her two cousins, and her two cousins were able to be rescued by kayakers or canoers that were right there on the river at the time, but nobody was able to get to Thierry's in time. She was seen um, about a quarter mile down the river, and that was the last time she saw she was seen by anybody. There's a lot of um, speculation on things around the case, of course. Uh, there was a guy that was in the area that had brought a couple of dogs with him, and the girls were playing with him. To this day, nobody's nobody's found anything. They haven't found the pink swimsuit she's been wearing. She was wearing. They haven't found a trace of her anywhere. And how many children were involved in this? It was four plus her. I believe it was three plus her, but some stories say four. There were four kids, so I'm not certain. Amy, did you get a good sense of what this river was like? Was it deep? Was it wide? Was it rushing fast? Thank you for asking. Yes, I do work for the Illinois Water Resources Center. So I did put on my science cap and um, I looked up the USGS um, Geological Survey river information um, for that area. They have two gauges, one upstream and one downstream. So I was able to track the water depths around the time she went missing and how it varies um, just over the course of the last two years. The water temperature that day was around 75 degrees when she when she went missing and dropped um, to around 70 overnight. And at about 3 p.m. when she went missing, the water levels were about 15, 15 feet deep upstream, but only close to four feet downstream. So an eight-year-old girl, you know, she's she's going to be in over her head probably for most of that. But the stream depth itself uh, is fairly consistent um, since the disappearance. Um, but there has been some mention of, I know, sections of the Platte River back in the 1800s, uh, 1600s, I'm not sure, when people were <laughs> traversing the continent, um, <laughs> they, they found, they ran into a lot of quicksand in the Platte River. And so I, I think that's a valid assumption that maybe, you know, the sandbar washed away and it took her with her, with it. And there was just, she's just buried in the river. Color me ignorant, but I had no idea that there could be quicksand underneath water. Yeah, I didn't go too deep into it, but um, I mean, it was, it was definitely a, a warning back when they were trying to get across in the 1800s with their wagons and stuff. Where does the river empty out to? I believe it goes into the Missouri River and they have, um, so where she went missing was near Shram um, Park Recreation Area, like a state park. And they have searched all the way to uh, the outlet in Plattsmouth, Nebraska, which I believe connects with the Missouri River. And search efforts seem pretty extensive. Yes, they have had several searches. Um, I believe they searched two weeks straight right after she went missing. It's hard along the edge of the, the river there to even walk it. It's, it's very, um, the terrain is not good for walking and it's very, just not safe. And so they searched for two weeks after she went missing. And then again, uh, I believe in October of 2020, they had a big push um, to find any, anything, recover anything. And they were not able to do that. At that time, I've heard that Adventures with Purpose went out there as well. But during that time, the river was not deep enough for them to search. And I know they're more looking for cars and things like that. So I'm not sure that their equipment would be adequate for finding an eight-year-old. So they have had extensive searches out there and, and still have not recovered anything. There is a pedestrian bridge just downstream that she may have gotten hung up on. There's kind of a, um, in the columns, there's like a cavern kind of where maybe she could have gotten stuck in there, but nobody's been able to investigate that angle. You mentioned um, some account of a unidentified man playing with the children. Do the police or law enforcement like suspect any kind of foul play? Like she may have, might have been abducted? It doesn't seem like it. It seems like that's more of a, the parents' suspicions. The sheriff's office is calling it a recovery mission now. They're, they're not looking any other angles as far as I could tell. And, and I could not 
find out if they ever identified that man with the dogs or not. What kind of equipment would be needed to search the bottom of a river if you're considering somebody is underneath the sand, like in the quicksand? What I have no idea what that would be. GPR, maybe? Yeah. It's a whole new territory that we've experienced or that we've heard of. You know, maybe at the time, if they had some kind of heat heat radar, they could have detected her body. But at this point, I'm not sure what they could do. If you're talking about, um, when you said heat radar, if they're talking about flares um, in rivers, the, the flare is only going to detect what's on top of the river. If anything's underneath, it won't detect anything underneath it. Just like it won't look through windows, it won't do any of that. It just is surface only. It, I even wonder, so what would be the state of the remains if they are buried in quicksand? So like, what are they looking for? Are they looking for a body or are they looking for skeletal remains at this point? I mean, I wonder if, if quicksand has any effect on, on um, decomposition. I'm sure it does with, you know, just being in the river with the sand brushing over, brushing over it all the time. I'm sure there's probably not much left at this point. What kind of media attention has this disappearance gotten? There was a lot to begin with the first couple of weeks, and then it dropped off. And um, it's mostly just been on the anniversary where they get the parents get a little bit more um, FaceTime with the media. And next, we wanted to talk about another submission to private investigations for the missing. It's the case of Frank Carlisle, who's been missing since April 24th, 2018, from Sewanee County, Florida. Yeah, so I, this is Amy. I pulled this case um, just recently. I haven't had a chance to get, dig into it too much, but as you mentioned, he went missing um, April 24th, 2018 in Sewanee County, Florida. At the time of his disappearance, he was 40 years old. He is five foot five, 180 to 200 pounds. Um, and there is some concern that he um, may do harm to himself. So he has a history of violence, um, and so caution is to be taken when approaching him if you run into him. He was last seen in the ranch area of Suwannee County, Florida, and he left home on foot, upset after a phone call with his mother. And I believe he left his, he left his cell phone and everything behind as well. So the reason that I, I pulled this one was that it was eerily similar to the Matthew Vetramile case. In what ways do you think it's similar to Matthew's case? Um, it seems like they're Frank and Matthew are kind of similar people. It, it sounds like they, they come from a similar background um, and they both left after a phone call with their mom, <laughs> which is just strange to me. But This is uh, interesting because I really hadn't heard a whole lot about this area, Suwannee Valley, until we had our new friend Jason Futch on and he joined us recently, most recently, about the disappearance of Detra McGuire and the murder of her daughter, her two-year-old daughter, Roshanda. And he hosts a podcast called Suwannee Valley Unsolved. And he is a ridiculously good researcher and very articulate when it comes to delivering that information. And it might be worth it for us to make that introduction with you because he might have some uh, information that is more closely related geographically because that's sort of his wheelhouse as far as like where where he lives where he operates his research and everything and we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program and then we also wanted to highlight the murder of blake chappelle blake chappelle was 17 when he was murdered he actually went missing on october 16th of 2011 uh, the last time I think he was, well, no, because he was seen by his girlfriend, but I, last time he was around people was October 15th. We don't know that that's the murder date because he wasn't found until December 19th. And the, the strange thing about this case, well, first of all, we don't normally do murder cases, um, but this one is a little different because he did go missing for a time and it's still unsolved here. You know, it happened in 2011 and here we are in 22, 2022. And 
he was 17 years old. And that's the other heartbreaking part about this uh, is his age and the fact that the night before he had spent time with his friends and his girlfriend at homecoming at East Coweta High School, High School. The interesting thing about this for me is that when he was found on December 19th in a creek, the investigators, and I'm assuming medical examiner, didn't think that he had been there for more than a week. So was he there? Wasn't he there? And if he wasn't there on October 16th, what happened to him in the interim and why? Um, he went missing after 5.30 a.m. He was texting his girlfriend as he was walking back to his friend's house that he was supposed to be staying in the night at, but he snuck over to his girlfriend's and got caught in her bedroom and then hightailed it out of there, was walking the three miles back to his friend's house when he went missing. The last text was at 5.30 that he had been contacted by a police officer wanting to know who he was and what he was doing, but that he had, the police officer had let him go. Um, so seemingly he, that was the last person who had interaction with him. However, the Noonan police department cannot find an officer that says he contacted him, nor, uh, they checked also with Coweta County Sheriff and nobody counted, uh, nobody contacted him as far as they know either. So whoever this police officer is, we, we don't know who it is. There's a, a lot of information, uh, background to the story, and but and then just a ton of questions as to what happened to Blake and why. He was uh, to add to that, he was found face down in a creek right next to a, a main thoroughfare, and he was clothed only in his undershirt and underwear. Uh, his clothes, his phone uh, has have never been found. And it doesn't appear that he was killed there. He was killed by a gunshot wound to the head. I have seen two reports, one that there was one shot and then one that his mother stated that there were two shots to the head. We don't know about pre or postmortem wounds because because now that it's a homicide investigation that's unsolved, they're very tight-lipped about what they're letting out. Talking about his time of death, um, I don't think the medical examiner was able to come up with a time of death. So we know pretty much for sure that he was not in the area in that creek he was found for the entire duration of the time he was missing. But we don't know if he was deceased during that whole time or if he was held alive somewhere, which is a horrific thought. Um, but yeah, and we don't really know about the condition of the body. Not a whole lot has been released about that. From what you said, Kathleen, they're just trying to keep information close. Um, so anybody with information that isn't out there in the public, they'll know that, you know, they have real knowledge of, of what had happened to Blake. Right. Well, the, the thing that we can deduce, even though we don't have for sure information, his birth, his death certificate says uh, unknown date of death. What we can deduce is that, and I and I have that in my report, which you'll you know it, it should be on there, is that this is Georgia, just outside of Atlanta. This is October to December. We have the average highs and lows for that time. We we know stages of decomposition. And we know that even if he was in the creek longer than a week, then it, he should have been further along in decomposition. It was right next to two golf courses. Um, and so a jogger found him. And if he was in there, stage two of decomposition is bloating, which is when the, the odor starts. And, and then it moves on to state. And that's a before a month happens. And so I, I know this is gruesome to talk about, but it's important in, in the timeline if we're trying to figure it out. He was not in a state at which uh, he should have been when he was found. Um, he should have been further along. And the other question that I had was that, so the place that he was found was somewhat on his walking path 
in the middle of the night back to his friend's house. So if he was taken, uh, why was he returned to that path? Because if you look in the area surrounding Noonan, surrounding Sonoya, where he and his mom and it lived, it's just filled with woods. I mean, there were so many other places if he, they didn't want him to be found that that he could have been placed if if that's what happened. So that's confusing to me. So that tells me that perhaps whomever did this to him wanted him to be found. And why did they remove his clothing? Was it to to conceal evidence? Was it because uh, they did something to the body that we don't know about? You know, if it was a sexual predator, if it was a serial killer, if it was somebody that had a beef with him that just really wanted his body to be found so that his family could go through this. That, I mean, those are all questions that I think are really valid. I'd like to go back a little bit to where you said that his body wasn't as far along as it should have been in, in decomposition. Is that that's what you're indicating that? the factors of the environment that was that he was in should have propelled or accelerated the decomposition correct temperature will do that yeah uh in the average is still in october we're talking in the 70s the fact that the creek was big enough it could have slowed it but still we're georgia so i don't know how i don't know how warm that water is it's not anything that's that's tracked because it's just a, a creek and the other question that i have is that his mother was told that his skin had just started to blacken and that the creatures had just started to nibble on his fingertips. And I don't know if the blackening is, they're referring to is lividity or if it is some sort of environmental other thing that could have happened. I mean, he might do that. So that's why I, I took all of these factors into account when I was looking at where was he on the path of decomposition, the different stages, uh, you know, and that's something that I looked up and looked into quite a bit. And I know his mother has done this as well because she has the same questions um, as far as, you know, he couldn't have been there. And it doesn't sound like they think that he, he even was there, which tells me you know, when lividity happens, that's that's gravity pulling blood on on the body. He was face down in the creek. Where was the even if he was there for a week, we should have lividity. So where was the lividity? We don't know that. We don't know about, any, like I said, any pre or postmortem wounding. So we just have no idea what could have happened to him. He did have one enemy that we know of. Uh, he had an altercation with his ex-girlfriend's stepfather and there's some shady stuff going on with those people in that situation uh, that you'll hear about in the, or that you've heard about in the the um, podcast uh, so I won't go into it now but you know, I really wanted to go in and and say that it it wasn't this guy that was responsible for it. But by the time I finished writing, I don't know that I can say that. I don't know how, because it was, you know, 530 in the morning, a, ra a random morning um, on a random day, two counties away. But I still can't shake the feeling that he's in, he may be involved in somehow. A great work on that. When you're looking into something like that, especially on the postmortem stuff, are you reaching out to people that you know have uh, maybe experts in in things like lividity and uh, decomposition? Uh, what kind of research do you do when you're looking into that? I still just go uh, online. I, I don't contact any of the people. Well, I mean, the officers that I know don't do that that would be done by a crime lab and and i don't have contact with the people that are in the part of the crime lab i don't uh the work that i do for my main job doesn't work with with that so i mean i, I could chase it down but google is such a wonderful resource you know that uh that that the, there's plenty of information on forensics out there by reputable places 
And how did this research come together? And um, I believe, did we speak with um, Blake's mother for this interview, for these episodes? Yeah, it was a joint effort between myself and Kathleen. Um, Kathleen did a lot of the background. You pulled so much information together, Kathleen. I really um, appreciate your hard work into that case. Um, I had the opportunity to interview his mother, Melissa Becker, as well as their family advocate, LaShonda and um, a journalist who was who did the like kind of an expose on the investigation uh, around the time of Blake's death. Um, so yeah, it was a it was one of those cases that like you read about, and because it was it, it is a murder case, um, it it jumped out obviously from the other cases that are like you know you have so little to go on um these various disappearances but just the fact that he was so young and his mother um is so well spoken and she's such a i hate to say it like a good storyteller but she she really like draws you into her experience and like makes you feel what like i guess like a fraction of what she must have felt at the time and um just doing the research and speaking to her i think both kathleen and i Correct me if I'm wrong, Kathleen, but we we got really drawn in to Blake's story. Yeah, it was hard for me to give it up and and put an end to it. It really was. I, I kept it for longer than I normally keep cases because I just felt like there was something out there that I was not that I was missing, in, but the, the, a piece to the puzzle that I was desperately searching for, but I didn't know what it was. And so it was... It was, it was hard to say, okay, this is time out. This is the end. I can't go down any more rabbit holes. This needs to be out there. I think I've got everything that you guys really need. Um, and then it's time to let it go and just, again, watch it from the backside to see if I see anything that I need to let anybody know of. Again, this, this may be one, unless it was, you know, just an opportunist, um, somebody grabbing him and then murdering him. I think that this has got to be something where multiple people may know and, you know, loose leaks, lips sink ships. So the more people who know increases the chance that it's going to come out someday. And I want, and I want to put it out there too, that we know that he was hightailing at home because he got caught at his girlfriend's house. But from everything I've seen, read, heard from that his, her parents were completely cooperative. Uh, I know that people on places like Reddit were trying to point fingers there, but I, I just, I don't get that feeling. I, I, they seem to help um, what, whatever they needed to do um, it, it, to help with the investigation. And I just don't think that that's a place to look. It's a good point. How old was his girlfriend? I believe same age. 17? Yes. Yeah. I do do not look at the parents for being upset and try to connect that to the disappearance. It's a 17-year-old daughter and the 17-year-old boyfriend is in her bedroom. They're going to be upset. They'd still be upset if he if nothing happened to him, you know, obviously. So, yeah, it's a good point to make like 99% sure they didn't have a hand in anything uh, leading to his disappearance. Well, they, they actually helped in, in looking for him that morning before they even let Melissa know. And the other part to that was that through the stories that have come out, what people have said uh, about it was, is that mom went in to address the issue came back to bed, told dad what happened. And dad just rolls over and says, oh, you know, kids will be kids. So I don't even think that her parents were that upset about it. They weren't caught in a compromising position. They were just talking from what I can tell. And so, but he was there, you know, at, at four in the morning. Right. And as he was walking back to his friend's house, he was texting with both of his girlfriend and her mother saying how sorry he was that this had happened and he would never do it again. I mean, he was a good kid. They, they were 17. It's a normal thing to have happened. I mean, I get the impulse to like look where motive may be, but this is just not the case here. In our last conversation, we had spoken about the emotional toll that this 
takes on the individuals that look into it, especially the four of you digging deep like you do and speaking with family members. So I don't know. I would like to, at the end of these conversations, maybe do like a quick round table, like a, like a check-in, like, how are you doing? You know, is, is it taking a toll? Are you getting more used to it? You know, where, where are you at in that whole like mall uh, directory scenario metaphor? Like, where are you at? (laughs) You know, the mall directory. (laughs) You are here. Oh, that metaphor. I got it. I got it. You kids need to go to malls more. (laughs) I can go first. Um, So there's kind of two, the the answer to that question is a little in my mind is kind of twofold. So somebody like Blake's case, um, I have uh, Kathleen and I had a conversation about that case a while back. That case has kept me up. Um, I just had a conversation with Kathleen and she kind of let me in on what was going on. I can't imagine what it was like to actually research that case because just from that conversation alone, it kept me up. I I have spent a lot of time thinking about uh, the possibilities in that case. And then this week, I've spent a lot of time doing some prelim research And I've hit a wall in a few cases um, where I can't find one shred of anything that says this person is missing or that they were reported missing. And that's frustrating, just as frustrating as it is to be emotionally involved in cases, um, cases like Blake, because I I don't know, like Kathleen said, Google is such a good resource. And when I can't find anything, I am, I I start to get creative and start to try to think of other ways to dig up research. Um, But it's just as frustrating when you're trying to find information on someone and you can't find anything. And we have like, you know, a little bit of a narrative of what happened to that person um, from the introductory emails that we get. And so, I kind of, it it kind of keeps my mind racing just as much as the cases that um, have tons of information and tons of media and tons of questions, because then it's almost like the possibilities are endless. Um, And then, and we kind of have to start figure out, is this person even missing? Um, And, and so that's kind of just as frustrating is when I can't find anything to give to you guys when I can't, when I have to turn over a case and say, I can't find anything on this person. I don't even know if they've been reported missing, but somebody is looking for them. Um, It's frustrating, but emotionally I'm doing well. So thinking a lot (laughs) about Blake, but other than that, I'm all right. And you bring up an interesting point because no one hears about the cases that you all are looking into that have no information and you go into it expecting to find something because we're all trained to find things very quickly on Google. And when it doesn't come up, then, oh my goodness, like, where are we going now? Now you said you had to get creative and that's good in a sense where you're learning a new trait and you're learning a new skill in your research and putting these, uh, putting this information together. But additionally, like that is very frustrating. So um, interesting. Thank you. Yeah. And this is Kathleen. I'll just say again that I have a tendency because of learned behavior to compartmentalize it. So I can look at things uh, like a like a like a business, like work. And it still affects me, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't break my psyche down at all. I, I am able to separate the two really well with that. Blake's was was hard for me because I felt like I wanted to be the best, and I mean, all the cases for sure, but really the best investigator possible in this uh, due to his age, the circumstances, we know this is a homicide. So we know that this isn't just an accidental death or, uh, you know, he got himself into trouble, went missing and, and something happened and maybe nobody had anything to do with it. This one, it was hard to let go of. It's near and dear to my heart, but the one that still tugs at my heartstrings right now, and I'm really glad that my report came through to you guys uh, in the same kind of way, because I can hear it in your voices when you're reporting on it, that it tugged your heartstrings was Michael Coral. And it seems like it really, I, I really wanted to convey in that one what kind of person he was. And it just seemed like he was just a spirit that everyone just connects to 
in, at least in, in with you guys. And I'm so happy that it came out that way. Um, and, but it's still, I think of him often and wonder where he is and what happened. For me, Amy, I would say the, the kid cases are the, the most difficult emotionally for me. I have three children of my own, so I, I always am able to put myself in the parent's position, and I just can't. It gets to me sometimes, but um, at the same time, it drives me. It gives me an urgency to, to help these families and um, do everything I can to, to bring them some closure. Um, as, and, and so I think for me, it's, it's the children, the small you know, the Thierry's price case and things like that, that, that really get to me. But overall, emotionally, I'm doing quite well. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Well, I think that segment went over well, despite the uh, questioning of my metaphor. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining us here for another Researcher Roundtable. This was uh, very helpful, I think, and I think it was really interesting. And uh, thanks a lot for uh, for hanging out with us here. Thanks for having us again. Thanks for having us. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for for giving us a a venue to talk about our cases again. I think that's actually also very helpful for us is to is to get a voice into what we've done to help uh, for private investigations for the missing and for missing the podcast. Awesome. Great work, everybody.